Hey there, welcome. I'm going to show you how today to use two devices, your Mac notebook as well as an iPad to do dual device recording for lectures with Zoom. So perhaps this looks like your classroom where you present materials to students through slides projected from a laptop. But given the current situation, your management may have told you that you have to transition to a fully online flipped classroom. And the question is, are you ready? Well, what I'd like to do in this video is show you how you might use Zoom, which you might know for teleconferencing, as a great tool to produce the fully online flipped classroom videos that you might present to your students. It's helpful first to look at the assumptions that we're making for this video. We're gonna assume that you want to make a video of a lecture with downloadable slides that you would distribute to your students. For example, through PowerPoint uh, converted to PDF or on Google Slides like this lecture. We're also going to assume that it's not an interactive lecture, meaning that you want to pre-record your lecture and distribute it to your students, a type of asynchronous solution. We're going to say that it's a one-shot lecture that you're just trying to produce all of the lecture material quickly and the priority is on getting materials up. Later on in the advanced part of the lecture, I'll cover techniques when you want to do more post-processing after you've shot. And finally, I'm gonna assume that we're on the Mac platform. You can substitute suitable Windows or Linux software as appropriate. Now the Mac platform has some particularities. It has a Mac laptop, but doesn't have the capability to write or annotate on the screen. On the other hand, the iPad is a great annotation device if you have a pencil, but the problem here is that the software is not quite up to the same level of multitasking as a Mac laptop is at this point. Let's also review our learning objective. What we want to enable you to do is become a one-person studio. That means without a production team, be able to shoot your own content, provide picture in picture, as well as annotation of the lecture notes. We're going to leverage the platforms and tools your learners already know how to use. And in particular, we're going to level up your skills on Zoom, both as a presenter and using a guest annotator using dual devices, using YouTube for distribution of your lecture materials, as well as simple post-production like trimming and clipping. And of course, putting to good use some free web services and free Mac software to improve the content accessibility. So just as in the traditional classroom, there are certain formats that work well and some that don't. In the online environment, for example, on YouTube, there are certain facilities that we don't have in a traditional classroom. For example, auto-closed captions, immediate fast forwarding and rewinding so that we can jump anywhere in the lecture, as well as speed controls to slow it down or speed up the lecture. YouTube also comes with its own environment. So for example, there is the YouTube recommended next video in the form of up next. This helps motivate the creation of a playlist that we would want to use if we're structuring multiple videos from our lectures. And to also suggest that we might want to tell our learners to stop and pause for a minute because videos might actually autoplay on their own if the user has it set up that way. We also need to note that unlike the traditional classroom where it's immersive, your learners may be on any form of mobile device. For example, small form factors like mobile phones with small screens. And this means there's clear usability limitations when you're trying to present your slides to your learners. And finally, a caveat for our international teachers, that if you have students who have gone back to their home countries, there are certain countries like China that limit access to Google products or certain websites through firewalls. For example, Bitly and Google products both don't work in China. And so you need to establish alternate ways for your learners to get to those resources. Now let's look at the setup. We'll start with the hardware, which is the simple part. We're gonna have a Mac notebook, which is gonna serve as our Zoom host for our meeting. We're gonna set that up and start the meeting and then join a guest annotator through an annotation device like an iPad. 
Now, I strongly recommend that you use a larger form iPad because our handwriting when we do annotation or writing formulas or other types of prose is usually not that great on a device. So having a larger device helps a lot because the resolution of your pencil will be a lot better. Optionally, if you're trying more advanced setups, you can try to have an external display. That's very helpful for hiding and swapping in other applications that you want to share content with, or a tripod with a phone for auxiliary shots, like when you're going to take pictures or videos of yourself typing or annotating. So what about the software setup? That's pretty easy too. We're gonna to need two Zoom accounts one for your main host and one for your annotation device, which is gonna come in as a participant in your lecture. You're also going to need your presentation deck, which is going to be in some type of presentation software such as Google Slides or Keynote or PowerPoint. You might also try to share a PDF file that you've prepared previously. To compile all of the shots together that you're going to take, you're gonna use QuickTime Player as another means of easy free software on the Mac that's going to join things together smoothly. Optionally, you can try to use Mouse Pose, which is a very nice cursor highlighting software, which I'll demonstrate now. Okay? This particular functionality is really good, as you can see, because not only do you see the cursor, but it makes it very, very easy to scrub the video after you. Better Snap Tool is another very useful utility that can help you maximize your screen quickly during lecture and I highly recommend that as well. Finally, if you want to do a lot of post-production and make your videos a little bit more professional, I suggest using iMovie or Final Cut Pro for the video editing. There's a third part of the setup too, which is about web services. You're going to need a YouTube account, which is basically your Google account, as well as a Bitly account if you'd like to create links that are more mnemonic and memorable. Optionally, you can use Google Drive to help create the slides, as well as Google Docs for keeping notes or helping the students create notes on their own while they're watching the lecture. And if you're doing a lot of post-production, it might be helpful if you want to reshoot your video to have a script. And very helpful for that is Otter AI, which allows you to transcribe your speech quite well. And is very helpful for distinguishing uh, different people in multi-party meetings. Let's go on to presentation preparation. Here are some recommended best practices to use to make it easier for your learners to navigate your video on the electronic medium. For example, you might want to use section slides and slide numberings to make it very easy to scrub in the video. Remember, our learners are using the online environment and they might want to skip to a certain part of the video. We'd also like to make sure that we avoid material in the upper right hand corner, right? Because as you can see here, the zoom thumbnail lies in this area. So if we put content in this area, it's going to be obscured. We'd also recommend, especially if you're making your materials available online to your learners, to have an explicit number of slide versions made available at the beginning or ends of each section. So it's easy for a learner to tell whether the distributed material that you may have updated after you shot the video corresponds to the actual one that's viewed in the video. Especially if you're shooting over multiple cohorts and terms, you might want to have this information up front to make sure that students know that they're viewing the appropriate version of the video from the correct term. Finally, online slides can feature comments, which is very helpful especially if you're using a system like Google Slides, or if you have allowed comments in YouTube, students can actually make their comments there and help you to improve your content as well, which is what I'd suggest you to do for this video. So I wanna make a quick note about synchronous viewing. For those of us who are using Zoom for multicasting and interacting with our students. So, Having an asynchronous recording definitely does help a bit in leveling the playing field because we have all of these other affordances like stop, rewinding, and uh, speeding up and slowing down the lecture. But in case you're doing a synchronous lecture, you might want to follow these tips as well. So first of all, you probably want to be able to mute all attendees on entry so that their microphones don't disturb your lecture and 
super busy with having multiple people interact with the environment. Similarly, you can try these other two tips as well to create a Zoom waiting room and disabling the chime upon entry so that users can go in and out of the lecture as they wish. If you're going to be using synchronous viewing for multiple lectures, uh, having the Zoom ID is something difficult to remember. You can use a URL shortened service like Bitly to shorten your room ID to something more memorable that students can remember and key in directly into their browser, which will launch the Zoom client automatically. I'd also like to share with you a particular tip about URL shorteners. So URL shorteners make things a lot more memorable by allowing you to assign a mnemonic name that's suited for your lecture topic. So for example, I can type topic one and then put 01, 02, all the way to whatever, like 14. And then it's easy for a learner to remember exactly where to find the next lecture slides without needing to fumble through a separate uh, website to find the link. They can type it directly into their browsers. It also has the side effect of making QR code generation a lot cleaner because there's less text involved, the QR code is likely to be less complex and easier to access. Also, do try to choose a structure that no one else in your organization or your students might use. You might try to reserve parts of the structure of the links and then edit them as appropriate when you need them. Great, all right, we're finished with this first half. I look forward to seeing you on the second half where we're going to cover recording and post-production.